Hey everybody, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another ODWire webinar. Tonight we got a fun one for you. Uh, John Warren from Racine, Wisconsin is here to talk, talk to us all about X-Fraction. And if you've been paying attention at all this week, you know we've had a series on ODWire radio with John talking all about how to get high-tech equipment uh, into your office. Um, and, and do it without breaking the bank. You know, you, you may know John um, from his other life as one of the founders of Revolution EHR. Um, so John is very skilled in the ways of tech. But interestingly enough, if you listen to the radio broadcast, he tells a great story about how when he first started in practice, his office was about as low tech as you can get, that a doctor of 40 or 50 years ago would recognize all the equipment uh, in his lane. And then he, uh, he upgraded to be much more high tech. So tonight we're going to talk all about that and all about extraction. So I guess w without any uh, further introduction from me, John, why don't you take it away? Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, as Adam said, uh, I'm a practicing OD. I've been at it for a little over 20 years, and I've really seen our profession change a, a lot as, as far as technology goes. One of the biggest things I've seen is the addition of the, you know, the computer, the microprocessor, and it's really changed pretty much everything we do diagnostically. But it also has the ability to change what we do as far as uh, evaluating the visual system of our, our patients. X-fraction is, is a term that uh, Marco used to describe uh, the use of some of their technology, uh, specifically the optical path difference device, or OPD, uh, to measure wavefront technology, and then combining that with an automated digital refraction system. Uh, the unit that I have is what it's called the 5100, or RT5100 is the version I have. They also have a 3100 and an older 2100 uh, device. And, and these devices can be deployed either in a standard exam room, which is how I have mine deployed, or as a, uh, a smaller workspace, smaller footprint called the EPIC. So uh, when you hear EPIC or you hear 5100, or they used to refer to as the TRS, or Total Refraction System, we're really talking about the same working pieces that are involved. Uh, the working pieces are the, the OPD or the optical path difference device. I started out with actually the old uh, OPD-2, which they referred to as the 3D wave. I now have the OPD-3, which is a, a moderate improvement on the OPD-2, a little bit larger area that it, it scans. It re re returns a little bit more information, especially about the cornea uh, via topography. Um, I also use a lens meter, just an automated lens meter that um, is nothing. The one I use is, is nothing spectacular. It's accurate and easy to use, so my staff can easily neutralize glasses. Um, and then those two devices feed into the RT5100, as you see on the screen. And it's basically not only the, the command center for the 5100 acts not only as the, uh, the control center for the refraction, but also the aggregate, aggregation point for all the refractive data that's gathered during the encounter for the patient, uh, including visual acuities and binocular testing and those sort of things. And at the end of, at the, end of the examination, the uh, data is then all easily sent into whatever EMR it is you, that you use. Uh, the press of a couple buttons, and uh, you've got the data zipped into the, uh, into the EMR that you're using. If you're not using an EMR, you can, can print the information out on a tape that you can somehow get into your paper chart, either by writing, having someone write the information down, or by, um, as some practices, will staple things into the chart to get that data in there. So what I'm going to talk about tonight specifically are some of the efficiencies, ways to do more in less time. I'm going to talk about wavefront optics and, you know, what I like to kind of joking to say being more than a second-order light bender uh, and actually using, you know, more than just second-order aberrations to evaluate and correct our patient's vision. I'm going to talk a little bit about pupil-dependent refraction, uh, get a little bit on my soapbox about uh, different methods of refracting, whether it's lights on or lights off. Uh, and then in the end, it's really all about improving the patient experience and trying to give our patients a better experience, not only in the office, but then after the office with their new corrections, whether they be contact lenses uh, or spectacles, uh, orthokeratology, refractive surgery, however we utilize that refractive data uh, that we come up with for our patients at the end of the encounter. As Adam you know, told you in the beginning, when I opened my practice in 1997, it was a standard you know, chair stand, stilt lamp, four opter setup in my exam room. Uh, we had one computer at the front desk uh, that we ran some accounting software on, and that was it. Um, but as my practice grew and I added patients and I added technology, uh, I came to a point where I realized that I was about as efficient as I was going to get using standard examination uh, techniques for refraction. I didn't, I didn't have a big backlog of patients to be able to see, uh, to see me, and I didn't need to see more patients per day. 
but I really did want to be able to spend more quality time with my patients. So I wanted to try to free up time during the encounter to not be just gathering data uh, but or analyzing data, but actually discussing it with patients. Um, you know, and whether that's discussing their vision correction options, any pathology they may have with their child's soccer game, um, I wanted to be able to improve the patient experience and really spend more quality time with my patients without either seeing less patients per time period or working more hours per day or days per week. And in the end, I have to admit I'm a little bit on the lazy side. I'd rather work less uh, hours if possible. So I decided to make some changes to uh, the way I approach refraction. Uh, as I said back about six years ago is when I really started getting into this technology. And for me, it was, it was really more about spending time with each patient. Um, so in the end, I bought time. Um, I tend to enjoy things more now. The refraction or extraction, while it's important, you know, an important part of the encounter, it's something that I want to gather the data, put it to use, measuring the patient's visual system, and complete things so we can move on. Uh, and really put that data to work, uh, whether it's discussing vision correction options, as I said, or, or other things with the patient. Um, and I, I truly have found I, I enjoy my day a whole lot more. Uh, I did have a couple days about a year and a half ago where I didn't have access to the extraction system because of uh, uh, basically a computer failure in my office. Um, it was uh, the, the PC that ran, every, ran the uh, visual acuity chart and aggregated data was, was on the fritz. And, until I got that back up, I, I did just go back to using my old record uh, Ultramatic 4 Opter, and things were fine, but I sure found I did not enjoy my days as much uh, as doing what I had gotten used to. But in the end, it really, to me, it's all about comments like this that patients post uh, and, their, and their after exam uh, encounters. In, at least in my area, most of the uh, eye doctors tend to run behind. They don't tend to be efficient. Patients will be in the office for an hour and a half for a routine exam. And patients do not appreciate spending their time waiting for me, waiting for my staff, or other things. They want to come in, have a service, and then go on with their day. And it's comments like this that really reward me for having uh, brought this technology in. Now, I've talked about the efficiencies of the, the overall system. One of the biggest things is faster objective data collection. Uh, the OPD, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute as far as its data, lensometry, and then that feeding right into the, into the uh, 5100. Um, and as I said, it can be either as an epic, a small six by eight or so uh, uh, foot area, or in a standard refracting lane, which is how I have things configured. Um, but it's just much, much more efficient for the subjective testing also. Uh, the auto refraction that I start with after the OPD is run is actually customized to that patient. Um, I use less testing to get to that, that refractive endpoint. Um, and, you know, about 60% of the time in my practice, I'm able to use this faster refraction process. And it may even be higher than 60. It varies by the day. I have some days where the average patient age is 82 uh, and days where the average patient age is 42. And, you know, those 82 days, those patients tend to have uh, lenticular problems and opacities and other things that sometimes result in longer refractions. Um, but, you know, the, the other thing is faster data entry. My staff never has to write down lensometry values. They never have to manually enter them into an EHR. Um, the same thing with autorefraction, uh, keratometry values, all those sort of things, the, the binocular vision testing results, the visual acuities, all of that moves very fast through the office, uh, from the lensometer to the 5100, the OPD to the 5100, and then at the end of the, the extraction process from the 5100 right into my EHR. I'm going to talk a little bit about the OPD. It's a fairly complex instrument that delivers an awful lot of information to us in a very short period of time. I like to, to tell patients that it, it provides them with their optical fingerprint. It really tells me a whole lot more about their, their visual system than just an auto refraction. And even when you include topography, it tells me a whole lot more. Um, and then this data at the end of the uh, OPD exam is automatically sent to the 5100 so that I can start my refraction. The OPD, as I mentioned, is a multifunction device. And it gives me topography, aberrometry, pupillometry. I get a, a, a mesopic and photopic pupil size. Uh, that really is important when looking at, at patient's vision. Uh, an infrared image of the anterior segment, which is really nice, not only for showing patients the pterygium, but you can actually uh, retroilluminate with infrared and see cataracts, uh, RK incisions, other, other opacities very well for the patient. It's very nice for a, a patient. Um, education standpoint. Then I also talk about the auto refraction with an S at the end because I do receive it usually two and most of the time three uh, auto refractions for the patient. I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a moment as far as how those are displayed. 
Um, but I actually have multiple auto refractions to either start my refraction from or to compare things to at the end of the encounter. So as you can see, the OPD gives me a whole lot of information very, very fast. Uh, it takes about 60, 60 to 90 seconds from sit down to stand up to use the OPD. Um, and that, that doesn't include entering some of the patient demographic info, but from the time the patient sits at the device, uh, the data is gathered, the data is saved, and is ready for me to view at a review, remote viewing station, and then the data is written to the 5100, uh, the information, it's very quick. So it's not something where the patient has to have two or three or four tests run on them at any one time. They can uh, really sit down very comfortably, have, have this run, and then move on. In my practice, on one table, I have the uh, OPD set up, then the lens meters in the middle, and then the fundus cameras right next to it. So the patients start out having the OPD uh, done, lensometry is done, they're moved over to the, uh, the fundus camera, and we'll get the uh, uh, screening fundus photos if we're going to run them on that patient gathered very quickly. So in one stop, we're getting all of that, that diagnostic uh, and refractive information gathered from the patients in a, in a real short amount of time. This is an example. It's actually a little bit of an older output map for the OPD. Uh, and you can customize these maps to display as much data uh, as you want to or any combination of them. But over here in the, uh, in the upper left, you can see there's topography data. This is displayed as an instantaneous map. You can also do an axial map if you'd like. And if I were viewing this at the viewer software or on the OPD, I could click anywhere on that topography map and it will show me numerical values, and it will also show me the optical path difference at uh, just about any, in any other location on that map. So I can view a corneal finding and see exactly where it might be impacting the, the OPD, for example. The upper right is the total OPD, which is based what I, when I refer to the optical fingerprint. It's giving me the refractive powers of that eye through the pupil across the entire pupil. If the patient has a small pupil, you'll see a smaller uh, return or a smaller area. Larger areas, you'll see uh, more, more area covered. That's one of the differences between the OPD 2 and 3. It, the 3 does uh, cover scan a little bit larger area. On the, the uh, middle left versus lenticular OPD, that's a calculated value that takes the cornea, uh, the topography, and the total OPD and subtracts the cornea away and gives you an idea of what's happening in the lens. It's a really nice way to evaluate patients with that milky nuclear sclerotic cataract. Uh, you can actually pick up those changes in that lenticular or that internal OPD to see what, uh, what's going on as far as the, the uh, lens, if there are any opacities. If you have patients with real thick capsa, capsular haze, you can actually see the contraction there. Uh, I have a couple maps of before and after capsulotomies on patients where you can see how, how, how different things were once the pressure was relieved. So as I said, that's a calculated value. Then I have an example of the uh, eye image, and you can see the two pupil sizes, the uh, mesopic and photopic pupil sizes outlined on the diagram, and it also returns the values. If I zoomed in, you can see the numerical values for the pupil size. Down on the bottom left is the wavefront total, and that's basically the total amyotropia for the patient. And then if you look to the right, the wavefront higher order, and that's if you subtract out the sphere and cylinder from the patient. It shows you kind of how much clutter or noise is left in uh, the optical system after you, after you get rid of the second order aberrations. So it's a nice way to very quickly, by looking at this map, kind of see what you've got going on for the patient. I'm going to show you a few other things on a little different display in a few minutes. As I said, we have a lensometer uh, connected, uh, which is, you know, quickly and accurately automatically chooses between a, a flat top and a progressive, a single vision. And then just instantly writes that data to the OPD so we can have that either to start the refraction with or to make comparisons with the patient later on through the extraction. Talked a little bit about wavefront optics, and I'm not going to bore you with Zernike numbers and formulas and those sort of things. Um, but before I start the extraction process with the patient, I always view the wavefront information before I start. It gives me a couple pieces of information very quickly shows me uh, basically what their autorefraction is, give me an idea what their type of prescription is. And it also shows me what their central or in the dead center of the pupil, and then a three millimeter average and a five millimeter average, uh, what their autorefractions are. So it lets me know if this patient gets more nearsighted as their pupil gets larger. It might help me predict or uh, correct for uh, night, night myopia or uh, increase in myopia as the pupil get lar gets larger. And I can also look at the root mean square values 
to determine to, in, my, in the back of my mind, how well should this patient see? If they have an elevated RMS value, I won't expect them to see 2020 in that eye. Uh, if there's not a direct perfect correlation between our RMS values and best corrected vision, kind of like the comparison between uh, uh, you know, dioptric uh, air, refractive error and Snell and visual acuity. Not everyone who's a minus one sees 2040 uncorrected, for example. There's a little variability, but it gives me a very good idea uh, how well I can make this patient see at the conclusion of uh, my exam, and it also lets me know whether I've kind of gotten to that point. So a patient with a normal low RMS value that's only seen 20, 30, uh, either there's something going on in the back of the macula or I'm just not communicating well with them during the extraction. So to start the extraction, the OPD sends the best starting autorefraction. That can be different for each patient. If uh, it sends the wavefront optimized autorefraction, which I can tell from the control panel on the 5100, it does that if the RMS values are within a normal range and if there's not a uh, significant change in, in spherical or cylinder power from the center to the five millimeter zone, and if there's not a significant change in, in cylinder axis. If any of those criteria, criteria are not met, then the standard central autorefraction is sent over to the 5100 to begin the refraction with. So <clears throat> even if I don't review the, the OPD data on the viewer software before I go to see the patient, just by looking to see which one of the auto refractions was received, I have a pretty good idea how well this patient should be seeing and whether or not there's a night vision shift or there's uh, some, some, ab some aberration in the optical system. Um, during the extraction, if I'm using that wavefront optimized auto refraction, which is calculated at the four millimeter zone typically, the 5100 will automatically select which, select which refraction program I'm going to use. Uh, I have two, I only have two programs in, uh, an A and a B, but you can have, I believe it's five, up to five refractions programmed in. And if it sends the wavefront optimized auto refraction, the 5100 automatically selects, in my case, program B, which is the shorter or abbreviated refraction. I know that the auto refraction is going to be accurate enough that I'll be able to ask many less questions of the patient to get to the final refractive outcome. It avoids me, you know, asking, is number 13 better than number 14, for example? Um, and that's usually about a 45 to 60 second refraction uh, process uh, to do both eyes and uh, to do a near refraction and any binocular testing that I want to do. If there's a lot of binocular testing to do. It may take a little bit longer. Um, but for a patient without significant binocular vision issues, it's a very, very brief refraction. If I'm not using the, the uh, optimized wavefront refraction, then it will automatically select program A, which is a little bit longer refraction. Um, those refractions can be uh, set up and configured by each, each user, so um, the way I have it set up doesn't have to be the way someone else would have it set up. In my practice, the, the A or the longer <coughs> test, I'll do a quick visual acuity check, and then I'll do uh, the cylinder power, then the cylinder axis, then I'll check the sphere again with a red-green, then I'll evaluate the visual acuity. I'll then move to the left eye. This automatically happens as you step through the refraction. And also the uh, visual acuity chart is driven by the 5100, so I don't have to change for you know cylinder testing versus sphere testing versus red green. It's automatically determined. Uh, I'll go to the other eye and do the same process. I'll then do any uh, binocular testing, and then I jump into doing the uh, near vision testing, uh, the, or the the add the plus buildup that I use for my add determination. So it's not a long refraction by any 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 stretch of the imagination. It's kind of my traditional refraction. Um, but if I'm going to be using the program B, which is the abbreviated refraction, I do a quick visual acuity through the auto refraction, uh, do a red-green, and then do visual acuity. And if I get to the visual acuity I expect, and there's not a large swing in, uh, in refraction from the lensometry and things make sense, I just move to the other eye and do the same thing. Uh, so I typically won't adjust the cylinder on these patients unless, uh, you know, if, they, if they're wearing three diopters of cylinder, I'm still going to probably check it because a small difference will make a, a significant difference to the patient. But other than high cylinder patients, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly abbreviated quick refraction. And it's not something I've seen have a negative impact on my remake uh, rate. I had some concerns about that initially, but I uh, really have not seen that. If anything, I think it's a little lower. Patients are much more confident at the end of the, of the extraction than a typical refraction 
because there aren't as many questions. They don't feel that they have had as many chances to, quote, get it wrong. We all hear patients say, I hate doing this because I'm afraid I'll give you the wrong answer. Um, and at the completion of uh, actually the distance portion of the refraction, what I'll do then is I'm able to directly compare the patient's lensometry values to that endpoint refraction. So I'll put up a chart that typically has the 2020 line at the top and then 2015, and I'll ask the patient if it's clearer through their lensometry findings, or I click a button and almost instantly it shows the uh, final subjective so that I can, uh, uh, so the patient can very quickly see what their vision will be like versus in their old glasses versus their new. So it's a very easy way for patients to make informed decisions about whether or not to upgrade glasses. If the patient has significant light, night vision shift, uh, I'll also do a comparison between the final subjective. I'll dim the lights and talk to the patient for just a minute to let the pupil dilate. Uh, and then I will go ahead and hit the button to show them the night vision uh, correction, either the auto refraction, or I may actually refract them in that situation and then show them the comparison. So if they have a significant night vision shift, they can actually see what the difference would be, either with a separate prescription for night vision or sometimes I'll hybridize the, uh, the two prescriptions uh, to come up with that information. So it's a very quick way for patients to find out uh, what the difference in their vision will be. Um, <clears throat> this is the point of the, the presentation where I did want to get on my soapbox for just a minute about refracting. You know, traditionally we, you know, by we, I say people who trained around when I did, which I graduated in 92, we're taught to refract with the lights out. And one of the biggest reasons for that, in my opinion, was the fact that up until the late 80s, uh, to, in order to put a good, a good crisp chart on the wall, we had to have it dark until we had halogen bulbs. Uh, we didn't refract in the dark because it was necessarily a better way to refract. It was we refract in the dark because our projectors worked better. Uh, now today, with with today's halogen charts and then LCD projectors and, and different computer-driven visual acuity charts, to me there's really no reason to refract a patient in the dark unless you're trying to come up with a, a, a night vision or dark vision correction for that patient. With the pupil dilated, you're going to probably end up with them in their maximum myopic situation, which. For a younger 25-year-old patient, is fine, but a patient who's 52 probably doesn't want you to push that minus on them, even though they appear to want it in the dark. So I haven't refracted with the lights out now for about 10 or 11 years, uh, and I found that it's been accepted by the patients. It's a much more natural situation for the patient, and unless you have patients that truly live their, you know, work only third shift and and uh, are in the dark all the time. Um, you know, as I've alluded to with the pupil. You know, Lou, uh, Lou Catania kind of turned me on to this, you know, the pupil controls everything. And until you start using an aberrometer and looking at the different refractions that patients have based on their pupil size, it doesn't really dawn on me, at least it didn't with me. Um, you know, but the pupil not only controls how much light enters the posterior segment, but how that light is focused on the retina. Not only do we get a, a larger depth of field with a smaller pupil, but a lot of times people will have more amotropia with a larger pupil than with a smaller pupil. You know, what that means is not every minus 2, minus 1 and a quarter axis 180 is the same. Uh, some of these patients actually need less minus in the periphery. Some need more minus in the periphery. and Some are very stable across the entire pupil size. Um, so, um, you know, knowing how much, how much of a change is important, not only for the final prescription, but especially looking at contact lenses. Some patients do very well in aspheric contact lenses because they have that asphericity. Some have minimal asphericity and don't notice much difference, and some actually have a negative asphericity, and it makes it worse. I've actually had patients that I've put aspheric lenses on that said, get these out of here, I don't like them. I'm not seeing as well as I did with my old ones. Um, sphere, you know, the sphere power typically will change more towards myopia or out of hyperopia. Um, cylinder powers, in my experience, usually go up in the periphery. Um, the axis may or may not change. Usually it's more the powers that change. Unless you've got a corneal irregularity, then the axis may vary wide, widely. But these may be patients you're already aware of having a unique refractive situation. This is an example of a, of a map, and I purely pulled it up for the pupil. It has topography on the left, the total OPD in the center, and the internal OPD on the right. This is a patient I've been seeing for many years, and he's actually got a moderate refraction shift. I'm going to blow up one of the maps in a second to give you a better view of it. But you can see in his case, the internal OPD is very smooth and regular. Uh, you know, he does not have any cataract or lenticular changes causing him any issues. But this is what he looks like at the pupil. You can see in the red boxes, the upper left is the 3 millimeter zone. I mean, it's the central zone. The one below that is the 3 millimeter zone, and to the right is the 5 millimeter zone. 
and you can see that its sphere goes from minus 75 uh, in the center to a minus one and a quarter when we get into that five millimeter zone. If we ran this on it with a dilated pupil, I would expect we'll probably, we'd probably pick up even a little bit more minus in this patient. Cylinder stays pretty stable between a quarter to a half diopter of cylinder, and the axis stays fairly stable also. Uh, but this is an example of a patient who, upon questioning, a lot of times when I see this on a first-time patient, part of my, my history would be, how's your night vision? Is it kind of bad? And uh, more times than not, they'll say, yeah, how did you know that? Then I'll show them the map and use it, A, for a patient education, but also as an instructional, this is what we may need to do as far as your prescription goes. So when you take a look at putting it all together, it really, the X fraction really starts with the objective data collection with the OPD and the lens meter. It's very quick. It's certainly the, the OPD is no longer run than a typical autorefractor, autocare autometer. Um, they actually, it's actually got a, a three-axis uh, uh, focusing system now. When you get that close to the pupil and the patient's looking anywhere near the fixation target, it's actually going to center the patient horizontal, horizontally, vertically, and in and out. So it's going to move itself into the exact precise point before it captures its data. You can override it and run it manually if you need to, but in the automatic mode, it does a very nice job of capturing data. This moves the data to the 5100 where the X fraction happens. Um, and you know, I'll complete the X fraction with the patient and then compare it specifically to the lensometry findings to uh, give them a better idea of whether or not there's been a prescription change, um, give them an idea of what their nighttime prescription is like if they're a patient that exhibits a nighttime shift. And then at that point, I send the info to the EMR and I create their prescriptions. And I use all of those as, as teaching moments for the patient to let them know what we are and what we're not, what we are going to or what we're not going to do for them. You know, in the end, as I said, it's all about a better patient experience. I want my patients excited about having been in the office. I want to be efficient. We're typically, because we use a one-touch exam, meaning that patients actually pre-dilated before I see them, uh, they're starting to dilate while I'm doing the extraction. Uh, we have it down pretty much from about 16 to 25 minutes from showing up to being back in the optical and ready to either do an eyeglass selection, or if that's not happening, check out and leave the office. So patients really appreciate the uh, efficiency of the exams. Um, and, you know, you can choose how you want to use that extra time. You can see more patients per day if you have a backlog of patients. Uh, you can see, you know, more patients per day to get rid of the backlog. You can work less hours and see the same number of patients, or you can use that extra time, as I do, to talk to patients more and find out what's going on and hopefully have more RXs created because you know more about your patient's visual system and hopefully have them filled in your office because it gives me a chance to explain the different types of vision correction and what we have to offer for those patients. So it's a little hard to see on the screen, but this is you know, an end result. It's a patient I've, I've been taking care of, Christine and her family, for a long time. Uh, but to me, it's all about cementing that relationship between myself and the patient and the patient and the practice. And there's really no better way to do that than exceed their expectations and do it in a very efficient manner. Uh, patients mentally, I know at least myself, whether I'm going to the dentist or my internist or whatever, whatever I'm doing with my, myself and my family, I typically go out about an hour for an encounter. Uh, if it goes much longer than that, I'm going to be looking at my watch, and if it goes significantly less than that, I'm probably pretty happy walking out the door. Um, so and the idea is not to rush the patient, for them to never feel that you're rushing the experience, but to be able to, to get, your, get your information, get your job done, educate the patient, and really get them through the process as efficiently and comfortably as possible. I know there have been some questions submitted, questions and I think submitted. Adam was going to probably ask a few of them. Great. Well, thanks so much, John. That was uh, really great. And before we get on to the questions, I, I completely forgot to mention in the beginning, if you have a question on the right side of your screen, you'll see a little box that says Q&A. Feel free to write it on in there, um, and then we can ask John. It's anonymous, so don't worry. Your name won't come out uh, for the world to see. Um, but John, why don't I, why don't I start from, a, uh, from sort of a very basic question for you. So this is about staffing. So not about the instrument itself, but about staffing. So um, you know, it's, it sounds like with most of the extraction, you know, you're letting your assistants gather a lot of the data for you. Um, how long did it actually take you to train your staff to, to where you felt comfortable with them using it? You know, it, it's really pretty quick. I, I didn't send my staff down to Jacksonville. You certainly can do that. Marco's got a, a really neat uh, training facility uh, where you can uh, have staff go down, especially if they're going to be doing the refractions for you, if you're delegating refraction. They have a wonderful training facility. Uh, but in my case, the operation of the lens meter is, is very easy. You know, you line up the, 
get the, get the distance power, it beeps. You get to the near power, it beeps, and you move to the other eye. The OPD itself, as I mentioned, once you get it pretty much close to where you need to be, uh, where the patient can see the fixation target, the unit takes over and moves in and out, up and down and left and right until it's aligned and then it captures the data. So training and staff on the devices is really, really pretty easy. Um, and, and getting the data exported into the 5100 is not very difficult at all either. So um, I, I couldn't give you an hours and days standpoint, but it's certainly a, a matter of a half a day probably for, for someone who's comfortable using computers and electronic devices. So it's not something that's very, very onerous or takes an awful lot of, lot of time to get your staff up to speed with. Right. And how does the training actually happen? Did you do it yourself or did someone from Marco come in? How did, how did you do it? Um, when uh, I brought the unit in, the, the area manager from Marco came up and, and did the, I'll have to admit, I'm kind of a geek. I actually had the whole thing set up and plugged <laughs> up and working together before, before the rep got there. But as far as training with the staff or myself how to operate it, the, the man, area manager was there for a day. Um, really spent about probably two hours going over the devices and how they work together and training the staff on how to use them. And most of the rest of the time is spent with me getting me beyond, you know, kind of giving up that, that hands-on the four-opter uh, control factor. That the, one of the things the 5100 does is you can do a standard Jackson cross cylinder or JCC for the cylinder power and uh, the cylinder power and axis, if you'd like, but it, it also offers a split prism, which gives the patient a view of both astigmatism correction choices for self, for axis and for power. And it's a really weird thing for someone who's been doing the Jackson Cross cylinder for a decade or longer to stop doing that and use this other method. And Chris had to spend about an hour holding my hand getting me past that. Um, but really, from a staff training standpoint, the area manager handled all of that and really got the staff up to speed, showed me how to use it also so that if a new staff member came on, we could uh, you know, train that staff member ourselves, which we've had to do. Um, but it's very intuitive, so it's not something that takes a long time to run the devices. Sure. And uh, it looks like you, you dilate the patients before they do extraction? Yeah, and it, that's not part of the extraction experience, but that's how I do it. Um, I've been talked with lots of other people in lots of different clinical settings, whether they were solo practices, group practices, ophthalmology, optometry, hybrid practices, uh, commercial practices. And one of the things patients really don't like doing is seeing, seeing someone, whether it's staff and or the doctor, getting drops and then going to sit for 15 or 20 minutes doing nothing. You know, we'd like to think they walk through the optical and buy four pairs of glasses every time they're there, but typically they pick up a magazine and look. And then just about the time they're actually into the magazine article, we bring them back again. So it's another interruption. So we went to, um, we went to uh, this, this, what I call a one-touch uh, vision. That's not my term. I've stolen that from somewhere. Um, to where the staff starts out the encounter uh, by doing visual acuities is really one of the first things they do after greeting the patient, bringing them back to the, the entrance testing room. And then after they've done visual acuities, if they're not a contact lens wearer, they instill pyramid in the eyes or phenylephrine in every other year if it's a well vision visit. Um, then they go on to do the rest of their pre-testing. So by the time I see the patient, they've had, they've had their dilating drops in anywhere from probably 6 to 12 minutes. Uh, so the staff will enter information in the EHR about you know, their, their chief complaint, their history, and all those sort of things, get the blood pressure measured, um, and then get them through the, the, the OPD lensometry, screening fundus photos, uh, screening uh, endothelial cell count if we're doing that on that patient that day, and then bring them to the room where I actually do the refraction. So they never tie up the room with the, uh, with the quote, the expensive parts of this that only I use, which is the, the, the 5100 or the refraction head. Uh, that's never tied up pre-testing patients. That's only used for patient examination by me. And, you know, they, they get the patient moving. So by the time I see the patient, they're starting to dilate. I've had no issues with my refraction. I've maybe in, in doing this two years, I've maybe had three patients where I thought, gee, I wish they weren't dilated. And I did bring them back for a prescription recheck on a non-dilated day. But those dilating drops don't tend to have a, a huge impact on, on accommodation. So unless it's a, a patient with a significant binocular vision issue, uh, I've just not run into issues of having to repeat testing or anything by doing that. But patients really appreciate this because they're, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest time savings we have is the patient's not sitting for those 10 to 20 minutes waiting to dilate. So 
Uh, but yet I do get a, a mid to fully dilated pupil based on the type of encounter the patient's in for. Right. Um, question here, you know, we talked a little bit about wavefront guided prescriptions, and uh, you mentioned that your remake rate actually didn't go up. It might have even gone down a bit. Um, question is, do you have to use certain labs to actually make the lenses? No. The, to date in my practice, I'm using only a, you know, a standard spherocylindrical RX. Uh, we may use a digital, digitally surfaced lens to cut down on, on peripheral aberrations in that lens, but I'm not sending anything off to a specific lab to do a, a, a wavefront optical correction as far as on the lens. Um, and to me, it, it, that sort of correction for most patients doesn't make a lot of sense because very few of us spend most of our day looking through the optical center of our lens. Um, so to this to date, I've not actually written any any prescriptions that uh, uh, are anything more than a spherocylindrical RX. But I do certainly use all that wavefront data to drive my extraction process and my decision making when it comes to what prescription to actually write for the patient. Right. Um, interesting question here, and, and one that I knew that we were going to get. Um, a doctor writes that he has a small practice that he does maybe 1,500 complete exams a year or less. How can he justify the expense of a piece of equipment like this? You know, there's, a, there's probably three things that I, I tell most people you, you can see an ROI on. One of the things that's different about this, you, you certainly can, if you don't have topography now in your practice, you have a billable procedure in topography for some of your patients, uh, your keratoconic patients, patients with corneal degeneration. It can be like trying to pull teeth out of a hand to get insurance companies to pay for topography, but it is a billable procedure. Um, we've all been billing the fracture 92015 for years without any of this technology. So it's not like adding a scanning laser where now all of a sudden you have a whole other procedure that, that you can provide to the patient and it's reimbursable. Um, as I kind of hinted at through the presentation, there's the, uh, the comparison of the old versus new prescription. I was probably one of the best doctors in the country in t about talking people out of changing their prescriptions. Um, patients who would have a small glasses prescription change, maybe a half to a quarter in, in sphere that didn't take them from 2030 to 2020, but maybe just a stronger 2020. I'd pull the four opter away and say, are you pretty happy with your glasses? And they'd say, yeah, pretty much. And I'd say, great, we won't change them, and I'd move on with the exam. But now that I show the patients the direct comparison between their current prescription from lensometry and the subjective that we came up with today, uh, a lot more patients tend to update those small, those small glasses prescriptions. So, while I didn't bring the technology in specifically to sell more glasses, I, I, am, I have, you know, it's been six years, so it's been a while since that bump occurred for me. But um, I certainly think I, I do sell more small, small prescription makes without talking patients into it. They've seen it, they've experienced it, they know what to expect, whether it's going to make things better or not. The other thing is the ability to, uh, for similar to this, is for patients that do have a night vision shift, is to be able to demonstrate it to them. And in some cases, if it's a 25-year-old, that may just bump the minus and the sphere up by a quarter or bump the cylinder up by a quarter or a half if that's the type of change they have. But if there's someone who operates quite frequently in the dark, say a UPS driver who's got an evening shift and drives from, you know, into dusk and through the evening, some of those patients actually will purchase second pairs of glasses to uh, work better in those situations. But probably the biggest one is higher patient uh, retention. Uh, patients, whether we like to admit it or not, at the end of an exam have no idea all of the things we've done for them, even if we try to tell them as we go through the, through the encounter. You know, they, they compare uh, their last encounter to the one they just had. Uh, a lot of them, if we don't show them a difference based on whether they can still see with the glasses or it's better, you know, did the doctor have garlic for breakfast or for lunch and didn't brush his teeth, was he nice to deal with? But the actual exam encounter, and especially the, the refractive portion of the exam, they don't have a way to compare that. Um, when you start showing patients this and explaining it, and, and, and again, that will take a little bit of time, but to me, that's the quality time I wanted to buy by bringing this, this technology in. Um, I think my patient satisfaction rate is definitely higher uh, because of being able to show this to them. And it also in patients that have the subtle cataract changes, and you see the RMS value of a 0.5, which 0.3 would be normal at the three millimeter zone. It helps me very quickly know, you know, it's probably the cataract in this patient. I'll clear the macula to know that there's nothing going on back there and then start talking to the patient about their cataract and whether we should or shouldn't do anything to it. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a soft ROI as far as, you know, more glasses sold, um, making better recommendations for contact lenses, staying away from 
uh, aspheric contact lenses in patients that may, you know, get less myopic as their pupil gets larger. Um, and then the biggest thing is patient retention. I have more patients that are new say, boy, the other doctor never had that. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty confident I'll see that patient back again year after year uh, when I give them a reason to realize that we do things a little better, a little different in my office. Right. Um, question here about pricing, and I know, John, we discussed actually before we went on the air here that neither you nor I know anything about pricing at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you um, know, but whether you're part of a buying group or whether you're buying at a show, the, the numbers go up or down. Um, you know, they don't jerk the numbers around, but it's going to, the, the pricing is going to be a little different depending on what situation and what combination and, and, and what sort of promotion. So best thing to do is talk to your area manager and, and you know, find out what, really what device is best for you. Uh, and they get a better idea what cost is going to be. Right. And, uh, and Expo West is, of course, next week. So if you're going to be there, you can actually have hands-on experience uh, with the systems and, uh, and get a price there as well. Um, interesting question here, too. So the question is, how did you actually decide which refraction system to use, and how did you know which one would work well in your practice? I went about that two ways. Uh, one is I sat down at, I actually made my buy decision at AOA Boston in whatever, 2007 it probably was, 2006, uh, whenever AOA was in Boston. And I actually sat down, I'm, I'm a post-RK patient myself, so I'm not difficult to refract, but I have a unique refraction. I'm a minus 50 or so sphere in one eye, and the other eye is a plus 50 minus one. And this goes a little bit, there's another question I just looked a little bit ahead, I'll get to your question in a second, Ray, it ties into this. Um, and I had the, the area manager run me on the 3D wave, which is the, at that time the optical path difference measuring or OPD device uh, that was being used on the OPD, send the information over and refract me. And I was stunned at how fast he was done, how easy it was and how little of a hassle it was using the split prism compared to a JCC to come to the cylinder power. At the time, and, and still pretty much to this date, I believe, it was the only system that interfaced aberrometry with the, with the refractor. Some system, other systems may now, but at the time I purchased it, it was the only one. It's the one that's been doing it the longest. Um, so that's really why I, I lean more towards the Marco system is because of the integration between all of the devices. They all talk together, you know, easy to communicate. Um, I refer to that split prism test, um, and, and Ray asked a question about that. Um, there are some people that just don't do well with that simultaneous split prism. I usually don't go back and do a JCC on them instead. I usually just show them a 2030 or 2040 line if, if they're expected to see 2020. And I'll tweak the cylinder axis by either one or five degrees, one if they have lots of cylinder, five if they have smaller amounts. And then I'll tweak the power and just say which one looks better. Um, I don't typically go back to a JCC if they fail at the split prism. Uh, I find these just don't tend to be good decision makers. Um, not that they're not a smart patient or anything, but they just have a hard time determining the difference and deciding what to go with. So that's typically what I do. But it was really being refracted with the split prism and then having an integrated system that used aberrometry even six or seven years ago uh, in the system is really what convinced me to go with the Marco system. Right. And the question here, is there training available, not so much for your staff, but for the doctor who implements this who might not be comfortable with all the reams of data that it creates um, and might not understand yeah. how to interpret it necessarily? Yeah, there is. So, you know, when you have the system installed, the area manager goes over basic maps and configuration and, and some, some basic things. Um, and I just kind of dove in, and, and I've been using scanning lasers and looking at graphical outputs. And, and I spend much more time looking at the, the, the pretty pictures uh, the, the graphical information on the OPD and for my, with my OCTs and other devices. Um, but Marco does have an online training system that you can log into. Once you're a, once you're a user, they give you a username and password, and you can log in. Um, and, you know, any of the doctors in your practice, or if you want a staff member to learn, can log in and uh, go through the training system. I didn't take a lot of advantage of that. I, I went live and was using this before that system existed or in the, in the form it's in now. But they do have a pretty nice, I've taken a quick look at it, they have a pretty nice set of uh, online training tools for people to uh, improve their knowledge and be able to put the information to use. Because, you know, as you kind of alluded to, all this stuff doesn't do you much good if you don't know what it is. And uh, right. it is pretty easy, to, pretty easy to pick up on, but they have a pretty nice training facility or training, online training set up for you. Right. 
And we have another question here. And actually, this is also from Ray, who asked the question before. He actually has um, six of these 5,100 units in his office. So he's very familiar with the instrument. And he's actually got a, a sort of a, an inside question here. So what do you do to shade the too bright LED near point light? <laughs> Um, I haven't done anything with it. I believe you can change the brightness of that, though, on the control panel, Ray. Um, you might want to check with your either, you know, play around with it a little bit or check with the manual or the, I'm a guy, I don't do manuals well, um, <laughs> or check with your, your area manager. Uh, I believe you can actually turn the brightness of that down. I don't know if it's a, 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 a permanent setting, meaning it's that way for every patient. Um, but I think on the left hand, so towards the left hand side of the control panel, there's something to do with the brightness of the light. Um, you could just reach up and shade it. You know, some patients, especially if they got PSC cataracts, may not react well to that light. Um, there's a, there's a light on the front of the forearm that actually illuminates the near point card atom, which is which works very very well for most patients. But if a patient has a glare problem, I know what Bill's talking about. You could either reach up and shade them with a finger and cover one of them, or I believe there's actually you can control it from control panel, turn it down. Right. And uh, I guess we have time for one more question. And this, this is my question to you. Um, mm -hmm. say, say that I'm a clinician who's you know, starting out in private practice. You know, I, I have a clean slate to work with. And I have a limited budget. And I have to get started with something. How do I do it? Where, what would you do? If you had to do it all over again, where would you start with your instruments? You know, with a, a brand new practice, a brand new optometric practice, you're probably much more likely to deal with patients initially with refractive error issues than you are to have a whole raft of pathology patients. Um, and this kind of pains me to say it. I came from an ophthalmology practice when I opened my office and was, you know, a very, very pathology-based. But most early practices deal with a whole lot more refractive error to start with. And I'm not saying that's what they only can do, but just when you look at the patient mix. And if you're going to spend money on devices, I would try to spend money on a device that most of my patients or all of my patients are going to touch or come in contact with. Um, you know, and, and these devices didn't really exist in their current format when I started my practice, but I would probably have borrowed more money and gotten into a, a refraction system early on uh, versus later if they were available and, and I know what I know now. Uh, it is a pretty, you know, I don't know exactly what you're going to spend, but it's more than you'll spend for a regular four opter. Um, but if you're going to be buying uh, an aberometer, uh, you can also get an autorefractor keratometer to use into the, into the 5100. It won't give you the aberometry benefits, uh, but you will have some of the speed, speed benefits and the comparison between old and new prescription benefits uh, to show patients. But really, it, it, to me, you're going to get the best bang for your buck by using your resources to purchase or bring in technology that as many patients as possible will interface with. And while OCTs are pretty, and it's really neat, and you know, other devices, you know, may may be useful for quite a few of your patients. Pretty much all of your patients that seek you out for routine care are going to come in contact with whatever you use to refract them. So, to me, that's kind of a, a, a big plus to lean towards one of these systems. But financial realities may say you just flat out can't do it. Um, but if you there's a way to make it work, I think it's something that will help differentiate your practice and we really impress those patients that first time through because, you, you know, you can never make a good second, a, a good, you can never make a, a new first impression. And, you know, that's pretty important when it comes to, to growing your practice. Right. And it looks like we're running out of time, but, um, you know, this webinar is going to actually be posted on OD Wire right next to the radio interviews that we did. And I'm hoping that uh, we can continue this conversation online because I'm sure people have a lot more questions for you. But before we go, do you have any parting thoughts for us? Um, you know, as somebody who's been doing this 20 or 21 years, and this isn't really an extraction comment, it's maybe game aimed at those people who have been out of school for 10 years and practicing, but one of the things that really keeps me engaged in clinical practice is doing something different, better, newer, or faster. And, you know, always try to find something that you can do better, whether it's, you know, reworking the flow you have for your patient encounter or bringing in new technology. Don't be afraid to do something different because different is usually better. If it's not better, you can usually go back to the way you were doing it. But don't just sit in your same routine for the last 12 years and not change something once in a while. Uh, it makes things more fun. It makes things more rewarding. And it keeps you from getting burned out. Great advice. So with that, I guess we're going to go. And I hope uh, to see everyone uh, out at Vision Expo uh, next week. And oh, by the way, we had an Apple TV raffle tonight. And if you won, you will be getting an email from me. So thanks a lot, everyone, for showing up. And I guess we'll see everybody online.
Thanks, Adam.